Okay. Uh, an earliest musical memory from your childhood. Uh, could you pick one out? Well, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, this is my, my, my childhood was kind of like inundated with musical sort of memories. Um, I, I guess <laughs> the one thing I can remember is as a very young child sitting next to my grandmother at the piano singing How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? <laughs> <laughs> which, um, which I guess it, it says a bit about my background in that, um, well, both my parents and their families were musical and in every house I ever went into in my life as a child there was music and the participation of music. Um, I can't say that I kind of remember something as standing aside from that like a particular memory because all of it was just about music I suppose so um, but I do remember that particular incident of singing my grandmother. What was your, your parents' background in music? I believe they were both musicians. Mm -hmm. Well, um, my dad was a jazz musician for much of his young life, and then he sort of, once he was married with a family, he he sort of did something a little bit more sound and then kept music as a, as a hobby and um, a sort of a part-time thing and a part-time professional thing as well. But um, career-wise, he pursued accountancy. And... Um, but... Uh, my mother has also been, she's played piano all her life as well, plus she plays um, classical guitar. And uh, so that would be them. <laughs> and my, I have one younger sibling, a brother Michael, and he's also a, a musician, a piano player, and a very, very consummate piano player, actually. How influential were your family in terms of the, the music that uh, you followed growing up, or were you rebellious and went out and sought your own influences? Well, I, I guess there would have been later in life a little bit of rebellion, but for the first, for most of my life, um, I gladly listened to whatever was going on in the house. It never occurred to me to sort of, uh, you know, to rebel against it. Um, I was never into the top 40 as a young person. I was oblivious to it, which was a bit of a, an embarrassing thing to be a teenager and to not know who Sherbet was or something like that. But um, I listened to what my, parent, my parents played, which consisted of um, Burt Backrack, um, Weather Report, um, Miles Davis, a lot of jazz, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and Carole King. My dad was a big Carole King fan, uh, Joni Mitchell, um, and then a bit later on uh, Keith Jarrett and uh, early Elton John. Um, and I guess, I guess the most outrageous thing I ever did <laughs> was um, get into Elvis Costello. I mean, um, my mum and dad didn't quite like Elvis Costello <laughs> 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 until he got together with Bert Backrack, of course, and then everything was oh, fine. Was, that and, <laughs> but they couldn't quite see the point. But um, no, I, I kind of like earmarked Elvis Costello for a particular interest um, in my teens and. Um, but that would be the, the most extreme thing I ever did, really. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're quite a young starter in terms of songwriting, about, about age 12, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess that... It's a kind of funny story, actually. I, um, I, I learnt the piano, classical piano, from my age of about seven. Um, and I, when I got to hear Elton John's Funeral for a Friend, which is on the Yellow Brick Road album. Um, m my father brought home the piano music for it and I was playing through the piano part to Funeral for a Friend one day and made a mistake and kind of never looked back. Mm. That was sort of how I came into composing. It was from a sort of pseudo-classical kind of angle, if you, if you recall that sort of the intro part to Funeral for a Friend, that there are no vocals and it's sort of... Uh, it, yeah, it's quite pseudo classical, and as a young piano pupil, a lot of the exercises that I was taught were were classical, pseudo classical, in their style. And so I found that the first pieces of music that I that I composed were in that style. They were like little piano classical pieces. <laughs> and uh, it took me another couple of years to actually work out that I could actually sing along to them <laughs> and put words to them. But, uh, yeah, so I composed little piano pieces for, for a few years and then decided I could actually sing and put words to the music. Now, where did that amazing voice come from? Was there formal vocal training in there somewhere? 
Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, I, I uh, went off to a palm reader, actually, when I was about 16, and um, I, I can't actually recall this, but I must have already had it in my mind that I wanted to be um, a singer and a musician, and she urged me to, to go ahead and get singing lessons because she could tell from my palm or something else that I was going to have the kind of voice that um, would would be subject to... Uh, a strain if I didn't look after it like obviously um, I, I don't know I guess she meant perhaps was reading something to my just my physical self that without um, a strong technical background um, I, I might not have the uh, strength of technique to actually sing day in day out without damaging my voice which was sort of I, I don't know if it was intuitive or just a great guess but uh, she sent me off to uh, she didn't send me off but she certainly planted the seed there and I came home and I and I uh, told my mum that you know that the palm reader had said that I should have singing lessons if I want to be a singer and mum said okay then let's find you a singing teacher <laughs> <laughs> so um we found me one and uh, that began 10 years of classical training which I actually have quite mixed feelings about at this point because um, I actually feel that uh, the classical training was pretty much um, I was at loggerheads with it in terms of my own music and the songs that I was writing at around that time which was between the ages of 16 and 26 I felt that um, no, I couldn't reconcile this huge coloratura soprano singing voice because that's what I had. That's the anatomy that I had was a very high dramatic soprano sound, and trying to actually marry that particular vocal sound to my little songs, it didn't happen. And I don't think it happened for me really properly until I was about twenty-eight. So. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel quite strange about that. I'm not sure whether it was the best thing to do, really. Uh, it probably was, but I'm a bit of a slow learner, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Scanning over the the artists that uh, influenced you musically, can you find a, a direct link between them all, a, a uniform quality, so to speak? Well, there's definitely a link in that they're all singer-songwriters. Yeah. Now, largely, I was attracted to other female singer-songwriters, basically other versions of myself. So, I mean, first and foremost, Kate Bush. Um, that was an influence that I denied sort of energetically for many years, but at this point in my career, I think, bugger it. <laughs> bugger it. She was excellent, and she completely awakened me in, in just um, informing me in that this thing that I kind of did at home when no one else was around and no one else was listening was something I could possibly make a career of in, in the years ahead. Uh, but after Kate Bush, there was a uh, Sean Colvin, yeah. She was very influential in terms of how to sing for me. I feel she really, really taught me how to sing properly. Um, then Jane Sibbery yep. uh, and Judy Zook also. Um, and then, of course, Elvis Costello and, to a lesser extent, David Bowie, but um, I kind of discovered him later on. And I also discovered Joni Mitchell kind of later on in my life. It wasn't until on my 21st birthday that I, got a, that I requested a Joni Mitchell album for my birthday and it was only then that I became aware of her but um, once I became aware of her of course I, I, um, I made sure of getting familiar with all of her back catalogue but she, I don't think she came in early enough to be a, an actual a kind of influence on my writing so to speak. Now, you had a bit of uh, theatrical experience before you, you first recorded. Uh, was that ever a, an option for you career-wise? It certainly was. I, I was um, in a, a musical that um, was uh, shown at um, Belvoir Street Theatre. And, yeah, it was sort of like singing, dancing, acting type of situation. Um, the show was called Pearls Before Swine, and it was... Um, it kind of <laughs> it was a bit of a daring kind of um, sort of kind of sarcastic look at the Vietnam War, which at the time was really quite daring. I mean, I don't think it would be now, but at the time it kind of was. But um, yeah, I, I kind of threw myself into it for the duration. But I, I must say, I kind of discovered that I didn't really have the vocal stamina to actually be singing uh, six nights a week uh, plus several days for matinees and stuff. Um, my voice is quiet. Uh, it's sort of a. It's quiet. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. small. My vo my vocal cords are, are small. My sound is not big. Um, and 
I um, I found that it was really hard work to actually do the projection that was necessary to for my voice to work in that kind of a context. And um, and also I found acting is like bloody hard. <laughs> um, I mean, it seems so easy, but just sticking, sticking my toe in the water without any like formal training, admittedly, I, I found it incredibly difficult and um, I guess it wasn't that I necessarily decided against pursuing that kind of a career I just had a feeling that I probably didn't have the vocal stamina for it plus other things came up but it certainly was a time when it seemed to be like a great option, a great possibility but it didn't happen Now you wound up with Mushroom Records was, was that where you wanted to go to begin with? Well it wasn't really a case of where I wanted to go I mean um, whoever wanted me, <laughs> I was prepared to go with. I mean, um, obviously, whoever wanted me was going to be the station that had a kind of outlook that was going to be sympathetic to the sound I had. So um, they were the first album that sort of, like, they, their interest was piqued by my demo tape. And they actually found that, you know, they, they believed they had, they were onto something in having to sort of, like, come across me. So that was ideal. That was what I was looking for. Now you had uh, English producer Gil Norton on your first album. Was that was that a personal choice for you? It wasn't a personal choice to begin with. I, the the uh, label, the radi- the record label, actually suggested him. Uh, and to be honest, I'd never heard of him, and I certainly hadn't heard of any of the artists that he produced before. I, I wasn't into kind of alternative boy bands, so I, I wasn't <laughs> aware of them. Um, but I I spoke to Gil on the phone. Um, in, in, the, in the months preceding our decision and I asked him the question what was what in his opinion was the most um, unusual record in his CD collection and that was going to be the, the question that did, or the answer that decided whether or not I would go with him as a producer and he answered The Mysterious Voices of Bulgaria which I don't know if you know it but it's a it's a CD about um, put out by the Bulgarian State Choir, uh, and it's it's this beautifully arranged um, choral work of Bulgarian folk music, which I happen to be a bit obsessed with at the time. And mm-hmm. you'll happen to mention that he also had it, and it was his favourite at the time. So when you over, he did. <laughs> that was it, as far as I was concerned. Looking back there, how did how do you think Mushroom uh, were they successful? Do you think in the way they went about promoting and marketing your work? Well, I don't know if if you were to say successful, then you would expect the upshot of it all to be that I was rich and famous and internationally well known, which certainly isn't the case. So I'd have to say no in terms of that. But from my point of view, personally, I was very pleased with what they did. Um, it, they took me on board with a, with the approach that they wanted me to do what I wanted to do. They they believed that I was a little entity unto myself. They didn't want to direct me or guide me or try and create a sound that I was supposed to fit neatly into. They wanted me to do my own thing, and I think that's fantastic, and I think it was Mm. totally unheard of for the time, and I really I am very grateful for them for doing that because um, they enabled me to put out the music that I wanted to put out, though admittedly, um, you know, it, it was sort of, I look back at the album now and I hear, and I think of myself and the little person that I was at the time, and I have a great lot of sort of sympathy and and sort of pity for myself because I, um, on, on a personal level I was really struggling, um, not in terms of music but just what I was going through in other sides of my life and um, I actually don't think that I they actually had the, the largeness of self or vision at the time to really um, do justice to the freedom they gave me. Now you were one of many that uh, gave a unique interpretation to the uh, Led Zeppelin classic uh, "Stairway to Heaven" on on Andrew Denton's project. There, did you come up with the arrangement for that? No, I didn't. In fact, uh, Chris Harriet was the music director of the program and, and all of those versions, and he um, produced the version that I sang. Now, I, to my knowledge, I think that a percentage of the performances of that song were uh, produced by the bands that performed them and played them but I think that Chris uh, had a big hand in the arrangements for most of the others and he he indeed um, programmed and produced entirely the piece of music that I sang to and I, I just walked into the studio and it was all finished and I just put the you know the, the music the melody to the music Were you a fan of, of the song beforehand? Well you know <laughs> it's a funny <laughs> question I mean I, I was a huge Led Zeppelin fan definitely but 
anyone who's like heavily into Led Zeppelin tends to, tends to steer very clear of that, that actual song because it's just so cliched. It's very hard to hear it without sort of balking that <laughs> in is some true. way. Yeah, very yeah. true. Pudding, uh, you're the puppet show that you've uh, had a contribution to. Mm. Well, that actually was a bit of a hand-me-down for me. I've been closely affiliated with Trackdown Studios for much of my career, and another person who was affiliated with Trackdown Studios was Guy Gross, who is a composer who has um, is quite a high profile at the moment. He's done uh, the soundtrack for the movie Frauds and Cut, which are only the two that comes to mind at, my, at the moment, but... Um, there are, there are others that are actually more famous than that. But anyway, mm. Guy, um, he was doing a lot of sort of composing work for various projects and there came times when um, his plate was too full and he didn't have the time to actually, you know, fulfil certain obligations and he would sort of offer them to me. And, and that was a situation that happened with Magic Pudding. It was a project that actually fell into his lap and he kind of passed it on to me. And I was happy to have a go at it because... Um, yeah, it appealed to me and, uh, you know, as a sort of kind of professional thing, I thought it would be very good for me. Is it important to you to wear you know, many different hats and you know, diversify, diversify yourself like that, you think? Uh, well, at the time, I think I was definitely into it. Um, I was definitely into it, but mainly from a financial point of view, <laughs> <laughs> purely, as a, you know, in a sense of actually making money. Uh, I, from an artistic point of view, I, I saw it as a good experience, but as far as a creative thing was concerned, I certainly didn't feel it was necessary for me to, you know, to, to expand into those sorts of extracurricular areas to fulfill all my creative potential. I, I was quite focused on my own thing and I wasn't uh, really interested in doing other things. Um, you know, there were sort of little projects on the side that I enjoyed doing, but as a rule, uh, I really didn't feel the urge to diversify so much, no. How do uh, Robin Dunn and the studio get along? Did you like the environment? Did you... uh, yeah, well, I do very much. I, I wish that I was a little bit more savvy when it comes to sort of desks and faders and patch bays and stuff <laughs> like that. I My... My my knowledge goes so far and then no further, and I, I kind of regret that I never really pursued it, but I guess I was concentrating on other things. Um, I find that when I go into the studio, um, I, I still suffer from what I call the red light syndrome, which is um, the moment that I know I'm in record, it seems like suddenly everything's ten times harder than it was before. <laughs> um, but I am extremely familiar with studios. I really am. And I kind of grew up in them. And I'm really grateful for that because it's um, given me a sort of uh, a vibe, I guess, and, and some ex experience that I I can sort of tuck under my belt and take for granted. And um, I'm not instantly nervous you know, in that atmosphere and I'm confident in knowing what to ask for from an engineer and knowing what's capable, what's possible. Yeah. Um, and, I, yeah, I think that, that I'm very grateful for the experience that I've had. Now, your second one was uh, pretty much an independent project. Was, that a, was there a nice feeling of freedom there, being able to, to work on a project without a record company over your shoulder type type of thing? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, that was the whole spirit of Stowaway when it came out. Um, I mean, the, the, the thought of putting out my own CD, written, produced and arranged by myself, was was like, yeah, it was hugely inspiring, the thought of doing that to me. And so the CD came about with that. Um, I was incredibly driven to get it done and to get it out there and... Uh, very much um, very involved and very focused on the work and the music and um, to have I mean to be honest uh, the record company didn't interfere in the the first album Labour of Liberty they they really did let me have pretty much um, free reign with that as well um, but with Starway I really could be as quirky as I fancied and not that I you know I aim to be quirky by any stretch of the imagination it was just that I knew I didn't need to curb and gut on myself mm. into something that was uh, you know commercially viable in, in someone else's terms 
you pretty much knew the direction you were looking for before you went into the studio? Well, it's not like um, there is a sort of direction that I foresee and then attempt to fulfil. It's basically, it is what it is and it just unfurls as it is and uh, I don't ha- I don't really have any sense of what that is independently, like objectively what that is. Um, all I knew is that these are the songs that I wanted to do. I'd been working on those arrangements for years, and, you know, a couple of years. I'd been working on the production, the sampling and stuff like that and building them up, and they were what they were, and there was no sense of trying to force them into being something else. They just unfurled <laughs> <laughs> as they were, and at some point all I had to do was say, stop, that's it, they're finished now, let's put them down. Now, with some production experience behind you there now what would you say is the, the key to a good production uh, well it's a funny one um it's gonna sound beautiful that'd be it yeah it's just gonna sound beautiful i've got to like it <laughs> that's it <laughs> that's important yeah <laughs> what about your, your songwriting method the way you go about it has that has that changed since you started writing um not really i found that for me always the best thing is um the, the thing that comes first and foremost is the idea. Um, of, it's That is sort of like the conception, uh, the point at which that a song comes into existence is with an idea, and that will be a lyric idea, which can come from... Uh, it can come from a line or a phrase or an experience or an observation, and then I usually take that idea... And then I have a bit of a stream of consciousness session with it and blurt as much lyric as I can. Uh, not that it's actually lyric at this point, it's just basically babble. And um, I let that sort of pour out of me and then I take those uh, that stream of consciousness to the piano and then I pick the eyes out of the words and I start putting things together um, at the same time that the music is created. So um, and I, uh, one of my favourite ideas is that um, songwriting for me is the fertilization of music by words so um why is it words by music (laughs) i've got myself confused now but um often i have lots and lots of bits of music floating around Uh, music is easy to write uh it comes really naturally um it happens very very easily for me whereas lyric writing is incredibly problematic yeah. I find it like constantly challenging. Um, I, I pour over lyrics. I do draft after draft after draft, uh, and it's a very difficult process for me that I spend a lot of time and a lot of sweat and perspiration on. <laughs> Whereas music's like it just happens. So I guess it's the yes. It's uh, surrounding for me. It's a fertilization of music by words because. Um, I got, you know, and often I have lots of bits of words floating around in the ether as well. And often, and I find that if those those words or that music exist too for too long without, like, without being married, they tend to they <laughs> they remain on the shelf for the rest of their lives, unfortunately, because they have become too familiar to me as um, pieces of music or bunches of words. So I find that the fresher both things are, the easier it is to kind of put them together. Well put. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, I've been spending some time on your website le- recently. It's a, it's a lovely looking site, and you've put some uh, reviews of your past albums on there, reproduced the, the critical reviews there. How do you feel about critics going, going through your work? Comfortable with that? Um, as long as they're nice reviews. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I mean, everybody, like, kind of, like, sits there and, like, attempts to be sort of unmoved by the prospect of critical uh you know attention um but i don't think i think you'd be pretty inhuman to not be uh a little bit kind of curious to know you know what people thought and especially those who claim to have some musical knowledge um you know and to know what they're talking about so um i'm always always very keen to hear what a critic has to say about my music and i'm always very unhappy if they don't like it and ecstatic if they do (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I can't distance myself from that at all nah. I mean, um, okay, Occasionally I will just get stroppy And disagree and think They just haven't got it mm-hmm. And that is often the case 
Um, but, you know, I've, I've been pretty lucky, actually. I've, I've only read, read one really devastatingly horrible review of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was devastated for the duration, and then, you know, I moved on. <laughs> yeah, got over it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, the last album, Spend Records, on the uh, ABC Music uh, Special Singer Songwriter Series. Mm-hmm. Did they let you know in advance what they were looking for there from you and how they saw you slotting in there with that series? No, actually, it kind of worked in the reverse. The album was all but finished, and oh. I was looking for an outlet for it. And um, this Singer Songwriter uh, Series came to my attention, and I, I kind of like pursued it and said, look, I'm me, this is what I do. I think I'd be perfect. What do you reckon? And they said, yeah, okay. So off we went. But it was all but finished. All right. Now, is that ongoing? Will, will you be releasing stuff through them in the future as well? No, it was just for that one release. Just the one, so. Yeah. Right. Does, um, does writing come easily for you? Are you? Oh, we've already covered that, really, haven't we? We have, but there is a little bit of an ad, sort of an additional bit of information there. Yeah. Which is about, uh, what's it, we're now in 2001, yeah. Towards the end of 97, I had a lot of difficulty with my voice. It started to die on me, and um, no one could tell me what the problem was. And uh, by the beginning of 1998, it was all but gone. And um, I was pretty much, I was, I was absolutely devastated by this, uh, very confused, um, didn't know what to do about it, no one seemed to be able to help me. I was living in Sydney at the time, living in King's Cross, I had been for six years and I, in my desperation I decided I'd move to the Blue Mountains to live, to, to breathe some fresh air. And um, I also took up a course of homeopathy to see if that could kind of help my situation. Anyway, about six months down the track, um, I gave up coffee uh, in order for the homeopathy to have a better effect. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turned out, uh, my whole problem, my vocal problems were related to uh, hypersensitivity to caffeine. Really? Yeah, in my sinus. My sinus just goes burko if I have too much of it. So I worked out that if I gave up coffee, my singing voice came back. Uh, my, I can sing fine, but unfortunately, the um, the downside of that was my creativity really suffered a blow, a huge blow, because as it turned out, I was heavily addicted to caffeine and depended on it as mm. stimulation to write. Now, I had no idea that that was what I'd been doing, but... Um, it turned out to be the case. Now, it's two years or two and a half years down the track now, and um, I gave it a while, and I found um, that I never really made the adjustment back to writing, and I feel that my, my writing uh, output has drastically uh, diminished since I stopped drinking coffee, and um, it's a, a real problem in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, partly why it's been, what is it now, it's about four years since my last release. I mean, I've got three albums in the pipeline actually at the moment. Yeah. But um, there have been, there, I was just not for six for about 80 months, two years. I just like, I was just treading water. And <laughs> um, I've actually started to drink one cup of tea a day now. And one cup of tea and I'm off my face let me tell you <laughs> but um, it seems to be actually in control I can actually I find that stimulates me enough to actually get focused on my work and to um, to have an output that I find is acceptable plus um, my voice is staying uh, it's my voice is fine it's not actually enough to damage my sinus and take my voice away again <laughs> it's been a pretty bizarre time wow so you managed to meet it halfway there kind of I guess in a way I feel so yeah. I feel like I've done that yeah. Have music scene up there, uh, like in Sydney these days? So you, is there a fair bit of work around? Well, um, I'm, I'm not living actually in Sydney right now, so I don't really have my finger precisely on the pulse, but there are a number of uh, groups, clubs, that I, I feel are doing a lot of really positive work. Um, we've got a group called Club Acoustica, which are based in Sydney at a couple of venues, uh, Iguana Cafe in the Cross, um, La Bar in Oxford Street, and also at the basement. Yep. And they are doing very much to uh, provide a platform for young singer-songwriters and bands and artists coming up. And I, I think that that's wonderful. So there's three venues that you can pretty much depend. Every week you can go along to and you can see a great lineup of some really good young music. Um, apart from that... Um, there would be there are larger venues for more established artists um, but I, I, w- I would uh, hesitate saying any more because as I said I don't want really to have my finger precisely on the pulse 
Right, so you're not actively seeking a, a great deal of live work yourself at the moment? Uh, not at the moment, because I'm, I'm heavily in sort of writing programming mode at the moment. Uh, as of probably three or four months' time, I'm going to be flinging myself at the live circuit one more time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I can provide you with something more uh, sort of interesting at that point, but not right now. And maybe we'll see you down here. It's been quite a while. It has been. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a very long while, but uh, it's quite expensive to travel interstate with sure. a band, and it's difficult when you don't have a, a large profile and the guarantee sort of um, bottom line attendance to be able to uh, risk those sorts of ventures. Absolutely. Mm. Now, did I see mention of a, a possible live album? Is that one of the album projects you're talking about? It is, yeah. yeah I... Um, yeah, it's been a long time coming, actually. I recorded three shows at the basement during 1999, uh, but the fairy godfather who was actually doing the recordings was sort of shortly thereafter kidnapped by Baz Luhrmann to be the musical, uh, musical editor of uh, Moulin Rouge. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you know, that sort of took years and <laughs> a lot years went over budget and took a lot longer than was expected. And uh, so Simon Ledley, who's doing the project for me was um, he with all best intentions it, it's really taken this long for him to actually get all the songs mixed that we uh, recorded um, I'm actually having a meeting with him this Friday and we're going to sit down and talk about um, manufacture and release uh, I haven't yet decided wh- how or who I want to put the um, album out through um, I'll probably do it independently I think uh, but um, if all goes according to plan, um, hopefully that'll happen within, I think, three months. Oh, tremendous. Yeah. I'm like, looking forward to it, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the internet also is a great avenue for, for that type of thing now, too, to get you to work out there independently. The but, internet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. Um, for me, um, I haven't... I mean, I've, I have not sold a lot of CDs over the internet. I find that... A website is a fantastic way of sort of basically just uh, placing yourself for a reference. You know, when people are keen or interested, they can go there. But I don't believe that just having a website instantly means that you become well-known or sell lots of CDs. It doesn't work like that at all. No, no, no. It, it can only work, you know, in allegiance with a bunch of other things. Yeah. And uh, it, the wonderful quirky thing about it is though uh, you you can get attention like sporadic attention from like far away places like you know Russia and Germany and Israel and it, that's quite extraordinary when that happens when you get emails from people who've just been surfing the net they come across your stuff they download a few uh, song samples and they adore you and they want to know all they can that's, that's extraordinary when that happens <laughs> And uh, another studio album, anything in the works there? Yeah, I've actually got a couple of things in the works there. I'm, I'm actually working at the moment on the, the, the next album, um, uh, which is program-wise, it's all but finished. I'm, I'm working actually with a friend up here in the mountains with, uh, with vocals and putting down some live bass and live guitars. Um, but it is taking a long time because um, we're only working on it on a very part-time basis. But... That album probably will be finished in about a year. Uh, and then I'm also working on a third album, which will be an album uh, without any programming whatsoever that will be with a bunch of musicians in a studio laying the tracks down, which I'm really looking forward to doing. Tremendous. Plenty happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robin, thank you for your time. It's been terrific to speak to you. Oh, my pleasure, John. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for waiting up for this ungodly hour. I'm glad you didn't have a coffee to keep you up waiting for me. <laughs> no, I've had a decaf tea, actually. <laughs> oh, good. I, I promise next time we speak it'll be at a much more civilised hour. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, take care. I will, you too. And we'll uh, we'll keep our eyes out for the uh, the new CDs. Yeah, please do. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Robin. Bye-bye. See ya.